dear all, thank you for coming in today. As you know, this is the last event for this academic year. Uh, I wanted to once again to thank St. Colpas, the initiator, the founder of this series, speaker series, who unfortunately cannot be with us today. Uh, we, are very, we are delighted, we are honored to have the wind Godfrey from Colgate University today. Uh, if you went through the announcement and you had the chance to check his web uh, link, you will see that he's very talented and pretty famous as a matter of fact. He's professor at um, uh, Colgate University. He would take me the whole session to describe his work. He has done so much, he has done so, so many things. Uh, he completed his undergrad studies at Yale University and he received his MFA at uh, Edinburgh College in Edinburgh, Scotland. He is the recipient of very many fellowships and grants, national and other. His work is in the collections of the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston and New York. He commissioned series of uh, works all over the United States. Odin, that you see here, in, completed in 2014, is a collaboration with architect and engineer Bosia, Lisansky, and Packer, supported by the figure in the Disciplinary Science Institute of, at Colgate University. And he's currently working on very many projects and on commission for many different things. Without further ado, I present you David Godfrey. And I'm sure that you will be Uh, well, first, I'd like to thank uh, Elias and uh, particularly uh, my colleague Bertha Goodman for uh, inviting me to be part of this series. Um, I don't know if you all know quite what a gem you have in Bertha. Uh, she and I met uh, working for the College Art Association. And she's been a tremendous advocate, uh, not only for your institution, but for uh, uh, art education at the community college level nationally. Um, she's done great service, so it was my pleasure to accept this invitation. So um, I'm going to try to talk a little bit about um, art and math, maybe, art and science. But before we start, I want to um, tell you just a little bit like, about the evolution of my work and how these ideas have influenced it. Uh, what you're looking at here is a sculpture called Lewis. Actually, you'll see Odin in a minute. Um, this was uh, commissioned by Art Prize in Grand Rapids, Michigan in 2016. Uh, and in the background is actually the first sculpture commissioned by the National Endowment for the Arts um, by Alexander Calder in 1962. Um, I don't know what you think of President Gerald Ford, or probably a lot of you have never heard of President Gerald Ford, but uh, one of the things he did do was bring this, uh, the first year of the NEA, bring money to Grand Rapids to commission this work. Um, <coughs> So um, the, the sculptor, uh, John Chamberlain, uh, you might know his work, he has these things out of smashed car parts, right there. If you've ever been to a museum, you've seen them. Uh, he talks about something called fit, um, and fit and choice. So rather than a, a found object, right, it's an idea that you choose something. Um, and fit is in the orbit of that thing we call composition. Uh, fit in particular has about it a feeling of the constructed, the three-dimensional relationship that indicates the proper position and orientation of things to one another. Um, you know, like the phrase, things fit a certain way. So, uh, you know, I've always been interested in the way that um, uh, objects uh, fit into a given space. This is a piece that's the Lehman College, uh, Lehman, Lehman College in the Bronx. Um, uh, very thin sheets of steel. They all start out round, and the shapes you see are from their <coughs> compression and stacking. The course of my work marks a trajectory that sort of shifts away from like strongly declarative automata's individual objects, say like a figurative sculpture on a pedestal, to structures that emphasize the relational existence of form to context of material, process, place, and collaboration. The work's about relationships, about the way things fit together. <coughs> 
I'm interested in the way shapes and forms can occupy space. How shapes inhabit spaces, position more than composition. This is a large series of large scale drawings that were involved with a range of ideas about topology, um, warping and distorting the two dimensional space of the picture plane, treating the drawing and spaces within it as a kind of a real space that the shapes brace themselves against. My working methods are grounded in empirical knowledge, experiment, carefully conceived structural processes and observations of material behavior, and how making and process transform the air ideas from abstract to actual. In the work pictured, I followed the outside edge of that shape in the previous drawing, which described a simple open loop. That loop was rotated in space, sort of like you twist a candy wrapper or a bread wrapper, by using a series of reinforcing steel bars, rebar, joined one to another until they described a continuous surface. The thing is your hand held together described a similar kind of compound surface. So this was a, a, a structure built up of smaller components, built up forms, linear forms. Um, and uh, probably both out of a decision of being sort of tired of welding, all those rebar. And, uh, and wanting to have a sort of inside and outside of the sculpture, I decided not to weld the backside, right? So you can see here that that surface underneath is all filled with weld material, and the backside is left um, unfilled. So um, right, right after that um, sculpture, I actually got a, a really a great fellowship that spent a year in Japan um, from the Henry Luce Foundation. And uh, you know this is an amazing experience, uh, rewarding and challenging, both personally and artistically. Um, and in Japan, there's an emphasis on process over product, right? Um, the devotion of the study of form, and I mean form in the sense of a structure, relationships to things or to a method, sort of like music, right? So when you play music, you study a form, right? Uh, and, and a historical precedence traditional Japanese art would have a real impact on my work. And I was studying calligraphy, right? Um, and I wanted to find a way to use the ink and the brush in my own work, but I didn't want to just do a character or something like a Franz Klein, um, nor did I want to make big shapes and fill them in with ink. And I realized, uh, sort of, while I was sitting at my desk, that I could actually build this, I could build a drawing out of lines, the same way I built a sculpture out of lines. So these are this is about, uh, about 10 feet square, this drawing, so it's ink on Japanese paper. And there are, these are single strokes that start at the, very, at the very almost center of that elliptical shape, and then go to the outside, sort of methodically building that shape um, from these lines. Um, and, and a few years later, I was actually back in Japan, uh, and I was working in granite. Um, Debbie said great, a lot of granite and great technology for uh, working it. Um, and uh, I was, the, the, those sculptures really were related to the things I've been doing before. Um, but what was really interesting to me about the stone was that, um, is that with the stone, uh, you have, when your surface of a, of a sculpture is the boundary between one material and another, right? There's no surface, right? In my other works I've been building surfaces that had thickness, you know, like making a tank or something. And so I got very interested in that, um, in that boundary, right? The surface is a kind of boundary, like the way a bubble of air is suspended in water. Um, and so I started thinking about um, how could I make a really, really thin surface, right? How, how thin a surface could I actually construct that had some quality of like that boundary between air and water, or between the stone and the space around it. So I started uh, work. This is a uh, steel packing strap. You know, kind of the stuff that you hate to get because it, you know, there's no way to throw it away and it's stiff and it cuts you and stuff. And I wove a cylinder, right? And in that cylinder, uh, uh, there were no physical connections. Um, there it is, uh, standing up. So the whole structure was just held together by its own tension. Um, so I, I started working with this vocabulary, um, and it also changed the way I was making drawings. So instead of 
So it was a, so instead of making a shape out of lines, I made a series of lines that uh, crossed one another, and then sort of like when you're doodling, you know, while you're waiting on hold on the phone, and just sort of let those let those lines sort of propagate across the surface, right? So rather than trying to make an object, I was sort of trying to investigate how a process could lead us to a place of finding forms or finding um, finding a kind of set of relationships that weren't imposed at the beginning. Um, and then, you know, things change, things move along. I just started trying to make a sculpture that, um, other sculpture that was worked that way. Um, you develop different tools, you modify different techniques. Uh, this is uh, you know, making those round forms that you saw in that first, one of those first sculptures. And I think what I want to emphasize is that uh, with these elements, um, they're not really very much, they're not like sculpture when they're sitting there like this, right? They're parts of something waiting to be activated in a composition or an arrangement with the landscape around them or the architecture. So when I started sculpture, a set of conditions are described. And that you can think of that like an algorithm or a formula. You choose the materials. You decide how it's going to be shaped, what its attributes are. You decide how it's going to be joined, right? How those elements are going to be uh, compiled in some kind of system. And also the final size or structure. And these decisions are informed by lots of things. Um, prior experience, um, you know, you make something that works one way and you want to make it that way again. You make something that doesn't work, you don't want that to happen again. Physical and economic constraints, um, an, I an idea about testing the thresholds of material, structural, physical, and personal limits, uh, in a process that sometimes you hear now in the field of parametric design is form finding. And all of this, I should say, is informed by um, kind of a, a real observation of the world. Um, uh, that is, uh, this is the back of a log truck. They do a fair amount of logging up in upstate New York where I live, and you see these log trucks. Uh, as I like to say, I didn't invent circle packing, right? Uh, nature's been packing circles for, you know, as long as uh, the space time has been around. I do these other small sculptures that are made out of uh, recycled plastic bottles. Um, uh, and so on. I like to test these the different scales and different limits. Uh, in some ways, I'm always kind of looking for my work, right? So a, a close packed set of spheres uh, at Walmart at Christmas, a uh, packed stone wall in Korea. So uh, working in this way, um, or actually, in a funny way, threw me back into this sort of more kind of compositional way of making drawings that is as forms on sh paper. But these are actually rubbings of uh, masonry buildings on my campus um, that are built in different ways. Um, if any of you end up studying architecture, there's all kinds of masonry rhetorics, right? There's a whole list of ways that stone has been arranged over the time people are making stone walls. So a drywall, like, so a drywall mason, you know, you've probably seen some around here. There's some, probably some fancy houses where people are having drywall stone walls remade. Um, so the first objective of a mason making a wall uh, are guided and constrained and inspired by the lay of the land, the available material, observation, experience, and improvisation. That is, the wall needs to stand up and it needs to be effective, right? So it's more like an act of interpretation rather than declaration. And I like to think that in similar ways, my sculptural process as it's evolved dictates its own form and arrangement where the sort of practical, in some ways, has as much of a role um, over an idea of some uh, preconceived composition. Now the other thing I'm really interested in is in, as you probably see, is in the behavior of materials, right? So there's, uh, so my earliest work was inspired by natural geometries, where simple rules can give rise to really extraordinarily complex organisms, for example, uh, like seashells, uh, honeycomb, um, the, the, way, the way rivers meander, right? There's a, there's a whole range of, uh, there's a kind of mathematics that sort of runs deep underneath the way our world 
puts together is, is assembled, right, structurally. And those pieces looked like natural objects, right? They were reflections of those systems. And so my current work instead aims to investigate a kind of a design sort of natural system that have dynamic attributes and behavior, right? So you set up a bunch of stuff and you see what happens, right? So it's right now it's about the influence of gravity, the resistance of gravity on materials and structures. Um, and this newest work, which I'll be explaining to you in a minute, is the idea of creating an internal set of structures rather than the shape of an opening in a wall to uh, influence that system and how they will behave. So the sculptures are an active system, right? So you can see here, so they're made of these steel bands, right? And so by making them in bands, they not only uh, deform perpendicular to the surface, but they also curve, right, as they sort of go around. So the behavior is, is quite rich. Um, and I like to think of them as uh, these cylindrical elements take form in contact with each other, and they form a community of similar yet distinct sort of dependent individuals. Uh, I like to say an aesthetic, structural, and material ecosystem. Um, and like other forms of stacking, from the stone walls I just showed you to bacterial colonies to soap bubbles, the material shape and behavior of these systems settle into more or less stable arrangements. Um, and again, as I said, ordered under a surprisingly limited set of geometric rules. Um, and as part of this process of behavior is a process of learning, right? In some ways, uh, my sculptures are, um, or certainly were for, you know, 10 years ago, big experiments, right? And I wasn't exactly sure how these things were going to behave, but after we would uh, use these parts and these systems, um, we would try to you know, eliminate the bad and emphasize the good. And here you can see just how much uh, dynamics there is in the material. That top cylinder is actually the same diameter as the one directly underneath it. So you can see the kind of stretch. And this is from a, a very recent work from last summer, uh, a detail of a sculpture called Inspire that's in Traverse City, Michigan. Um, and you can see here is that um, the big change is that we're not only relying on gravity and pressure to shape the objects, but we're pre-shaping them as well, right? So these no longer start out simply as circles, but we're actually packing them in very specific ways to um, primarily to get a more um, reliable kind of structural uh, system, right? So one that an engineer can sign off for a city manager and say, this will not fall down if the wind blows 100 miles an hour or we get eight feet of snow. Right. Okay, and you know that's the, these are the kind of things I think about. These are the kind of things I look at. Um, this is the stuff that uh, obsesses me. All right, let's restore the chronology a little bit. Right, I've gone really fast. I've gone from work that I showed you that was in this one. It's uh, I went to, didn't go to graduate school until I was 35. There's lots of ways to do this, guys. Lots of ways to get there. Um, so this is from the mid 90s, and I've just shown you a piece of 2017. So I'll backtrack a little bit. So um, here's that cylinder again, right? And the thing, the, the thing that I, I accomplished my first goal, I made a very thin surface, right? But it took me a while, almost, almost a year, to realize that what was much more interesting about this is that it was like fabric, right? Every time I touched it, it moved, right? It wasn't rigid at all. Um, and other people noticed it before me, but I was, you know, I was really caught up in this process. Um, but what I discovered when I laid it down is it did this, right? And instead of making a sculpture that resembled a natural object, I'd made an, a structure that had some kind of natural, I, and I use that carefully, that word, uh, behavior, right? That it didn't have one final form. Uh, and pretty much from that moment, uh, I, I just I said I can't do that other stuff before. This is so much more interesting, right? Um, so uh, it really stopped me in my tracks. This piece. It took me almost a year to make another piece of sculpture. I made a lot of those drawings that I was showing you. 
but I set out to try to um, find ways to make other kinds of systems with behavior, which is what led me to this um, working with these steel bands. Um, and uh, at the very beginning, I showed you a, a, an image of a woman walking down the center of one of my sculptures. Uh, it was a place called Sculpture Space. So sculpture Center, sorry, in New York City. Um, it was about 40 feet long, um, an early piece. Uh, and I thought, well, if I have one piece in a, in a space, what if I have three, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of geometrically expand the complexity. And what if I change the thickness of each element, right? So what you're looking at here on, the, on your right is a 16 gauge cylinder, a four, uh, yeah, 16 gauge, 12 gauge, and, and, and 14 gauge cylinder, right? So they're all very different shapes, right? Different, and they have different stiffnesses, different behavior. Right? And so these systems, they behave dynamically, right? Um, and one way I like to, one metaphor I like to use is if you think about uh, the way a flower can have a different form depending on the conditions in which it grows, right? If you, if it's in the shade or in the sun or if it's in rich soil or poor soil you get a different flower, but the information inside that flower, that genetic code, that structural code remains the same. And what was really interesting about this piece is uh, it was uh, put up in the fall, we had a late, as they do in New York City, uh, this is a gallery out in Williamsburg, we had a wet snow, um, and so the cylinder on the right collapsed almost completely. The one in the center got much more round, right? It's being pushed. Not only that, it rotated about two feet, and it weighed, it was by far away the heaviest one. And then that other one got jammed even closer against the wall. Um, so, uh, so not only had I sort of uh, set up a system that within its own rules behaved, but it still, it could continue to change over time in an interaction with its environment. My dealer was, she was, you know, the phone was like, she was crazy. It's falling down, it's falling down, it's falling down. I said, well, just, let it fall, right? let it go, um, see what happens. Uh, so uh, this is a, an image of that earlier work I showed you that was uh, on its way to being installed. Uh, just to give you again some idea of some of the dynamics. It's, it's parked here on this road because we've discovered that it's too, the trees are too close together and we have to pick it up again and make it narrower so we can get it down to the site. Here it is coming off the crane. So, uh, so as in nature, the variations are not indiscriminate, right? You can't, uh, a bunny can't turn into a rose, right? But you can use the genetic material from a, a, uh, a bioluminescent fish, introduce it to the genetic material of the rabbit, and make the rabbit glow in the dark, right? So. There are ways we can mix genetically, but we, the big questions are pretty much determined, right? That's a piece by Eduardo Cac, by the way, called Alba. I'm gonna look it up. Go on the dark plane. Uh, so the sculptures have an active role in your own making, right? Their strength and physical integrity depends on this capacity to absorb and distribute stresses throughout the network of components that make up the whole, right? sort of narratives of their own existence, and I think they construct their meetings through a process of making materials that determine their forms. Now this is the interior of uh, Odin, right, that we're looking at now. Um, and I'm gonna get on to the, the meat of the presentation here, which is uh, my work with a group of mathematicians, uh, architects, and engineers. Uh, that's uh, really where I am at now. So I didn't get here alone, right? Um, so, and collaboration is a very interesting thing, right? Sometimes in the art world, people are a little leery of the idea of collaboration. We have sometimes an idea of a, this romantic idea of the artist as this lonely person, you know, who has to work by themselves and has to um, make all of their own decisions, right? Has to provide everything they need for their own work. Um, so uh, in 2003, I started at Colgate, and there was a Slovenian mathematician there named Tomas Pizanski, he was a colleague, a research colleague, was one of my other uh, faculty members there, Thomas Tucker. Uh, we're at a barbecue for incoming faculty. He comes up to me, this, this sort of thick 
Eastern European accent, says, are you the sculptor? I said, yes. He says, he says, good. He says, I need your help. And with that introduction, um, uh, it really has really determined, in many ways, the shape of my work um, right up to now. So this is the first thing that we built. This is the thing, uh, the sculpture, well, it's actually a, a graph. Uh, it's a three-dimensional graph of a fifth-dimensional object. Um, this is what he wanted help with. Uh, this is a, a model, a three-dimensional model of something called Tucker's Group, which is named after my colleague Tom Tucker. Uh, without going too deeply into the mathematics, uh, because I don't understand them as so well myself, um, this is the surface of genus two. A donut is the surface of genus one. It means it has one hole in it. The surface of genus two has two holes, right? And if you're a topologist, you have to think about that the, those surfaces can expand sort of infinitely, right? So, uh, so on a surface of genus two, uh, it turns out that there are there's only one uh, mathematical group. How many of you know what a mathematical group is? Yeah, the matrices, right? It's algebraic. Um, that are symmetrical, right? There's only one group that's symmetrical. And what it means in this higher dimensional mathematics that algebra gives us access to, um, imagine a cube with 96 vertices. Okay, just think about that, for, right? Your, your regular cube has four, right? And in the fifth dimension, all of those 96 vertices are right angles. So there is uh, so mathematics gives us access to these kinds of spaces of spatial imagination, higher dimensions, right? And it turns out, without a surprise, that in order to make a picture of this, a graph of this, uh, a graph of this, is you have to it has its reflection is is in three dimensional space, but you have to distort everything, right? So the simple way to describe it, we're doing math here. So there's a figure here that has 16 sides. Right? Well, it turns out that this figure, described by these um, green and yellow lines here, right, also has 16 sides. Uh, it has six-sided figures and four-sided figures. Um, and again, in algebra, all of those shapes are the same. Right? They're symmetrical. These are the same size. They, they have the same relationship. But in order to build this in three-dimensional space, we have to um, we have to stretch it. Right? So we spent a couple of years building this one, right? uh, and we gave a lot of the mechanical expertise. I also worked with a, a, a man named Dwayne Martinez, who's a bomb builder on this. So, sort of again, so to go back. So after we tackled that problem, um, I came to um, Tomo and said, here's this pattern, right? So that, that sculpture that you, you looked at, this metal one here that I was showing you before, that's how I designed it, right? I just sat down with some graph paper and I drew a, a complicated graph, right? And with the idea that the surface would um, close, that it would be a continuous surface, right? Um, and when I was building it, so when I was building it, so you have this rectangle. Uh, yeah, here. So this rectangle and this rectangle are the same, right? They're the same dimension, but one is portrait, one's horizontal. And as I was doing the fabrication and cut list and so on for this, I discovered that for every every shape of Rectangle. There was a vertical that was vertical and horizontal. They were equal numbers, and I was like, "Well, that must mean something." But I don't know what it means, right? Uh, and so I, uh, so I came to Tomo and I said, "You know, can you help me with this?" Right? Well, 24 hours later, he comes back to me with this graph, right? And while this this may not look like the sculpture, what he's done is he took my sculpture and that pattern before and cut it down the diagonal, this would slide down here, right? So you have that diamond shape. So he just put it back together as a rectangle. And he said, he said, I've discovered something very interesting. Right? So, uh, and it's about 
length and frequency, right? So the top line is the lengths that are in the grid itself, right? And the bottom is the frequency that they occur in any given uh, direction, right? Um, so it turns out, right? And this was uh, a quality that nobody had ever bothered to describe, but if you have a grid of irregular shapes and the number of elements in the x-axis, that is, you have, let's say you have 10, and you have 10, 10 elements in the y-axis, um, and then the sums of their dimensions are equal, then you'll have a pattern, pattern that will tile, right, that repeats, right, that won't be random. So, um, and Tomo has done a lot of really interesting work with uh, things like uh, soccer balls, um, another class of objects called Buckminster Fullerenes, right, that is these kinds of, that are even, turns out are related to Gothic uh, vaulting, right, that the patterns and the design of Gothic vaulting. So again, these kinds of mathematical ideas that are sort of deep underneath, um, uh, say something about the way the world goes together. So um, we, uh, after this, uh, I was, um, I met this uh, engineer in London. I was there teaching for the semester. Um, and I got this idea, I wanted to work with him, but I needed some money. Um, so we applied to what we have that's called the Pickard Interdisciplinary Science Institute at Colgate, which supports, you have to have cross-disciplinary collaboration. Most often that's between scientists, say a biologist and a physicist, um, geographer, social scientist. Uh, so um, we designed a concept, so rather than trying to, let's say we didn't have a sculpture in mind, but we wanted to make tools, right? So we thought of this process that was a, that mathematical objects are abstract in the way I just described that 96 vertice cube, right? Uh, on the geometrical are, is sort of the virtual, right? This uh, computational design world is now uh, available to arch architects, designers, artists, and so on. And then the actual object, my bubble over here, is that, you know, what happens when you make something real, right? And just as the last case of uh, I had built a sculpture from which you could derive uh, or discover some mathematical property, right? We wanted to make sure that this, we didn't want to say, say, start with an abstract idea, test it here, and make it, right? We wanted it, these, these areas to sort of feed back with each other, right? The idea is that we would take what we learned in any of these areas, right? And it could go either way, right? It wasn't, it wasn't a linear process. We wanted to place a place where the ideas could circulate. So we did some, um, you know, we did some experiments uh, in the computer to try to recreate the behavior of that sculptures that I showed you before, particularly that silver one. Uh, and this was moderately successful, right? It wasn't uh, an interesting exercise. It wasn't particularly useful in terms of making things or predicting behavior in the physical world. Um, I tried some other stuff, some other prototypes. The big issue we had here was, was this kind of the hinge design, right? Uh, and again, the, another idea of sort of using a set of elements to make a kind of fabric, a kind of flexible, dynamic structure. Um, and these are some of the first experiments we did uh, that leads up, lead up to Odin. So uh, in, my, in the works I showed you in the beginning, the, those cylinders are always, most, they're on a line, right? They're like a stone wall. Right, they have to be stacked the way like I make a wood pile, right? Um, and I was kind of restricted to that, or maybe gentle curves, right? I could make a gently curved surface. But uh, it turned out that there is a, a, a circle packing definition. Uh, we use a software platform called Rhino. Some of you may have used it, it has a it's very interesting system. But um, so it can pack circles on a surface that you build in a computer, right? So suddenly, Right, we had access to, and these are just some prototype renderings of a similar kind of way of working that I developed, but now on much more complex objects. Right, and this is a an image that shows some of the design elements from uh, from Odin, which I'm going to be showing you more in detail. So these purple circles, right, are if you look here, see there's a little bit of vector. So there's a, there's a point in here that all of these um, circles extrude to, right? There's an attractor. Uh, then those, then that is projected onto the surface at these green lines, 
And then through a series of other operations, we can extrude these conical shapes, right? So this pretty much sums up the whole thing. Now, it wasn't simple, right? Um, and here you see the design model for Odin. Um, the red are thicker material. They, they, it was decided structurally they need to be stiffer. Uh, the gray is thinner. And these little green ones were ones that had to be added back by hand. Right? So in this early part of the process, it wasn't completely automated. Now, that doesn't bother me, but it really bothers these computational designers. They really want this elegant thing that just runs, tells this beautiful story. Um, but the really cool thing is that isolating a section. So not only does it give you these shapes, but it also gives you their intersections, intersection points, and a set of inventory information. And then it unrolls it for you so that you get this shape here, right? Which then can be used to fabricate that shape in any material, right? Leading to things like this. What you're looking at here is a, a PDF of a of a, a cut a cut sheet for a laser cutter, right? Because I'm the guy who's got to test it, right? So obviously we're not going to go straight to the steel. It's 40 feet in diameter. This thing, um, it's expensive. So we started in plastic, right? So here's one of my uh, studio assistants um, peeling paper off of the plastic after it's been laser cut. Uh, and what's also interesting is that uh, you know geometry in the computer is perfect. Right? Everything's flat, perpendicular, and uh, it's this great space of desire, right? You look in the computer and think anything's possible, but getting that stuff out of there into like the physical world, particularly with a program like Rhino, which is not a manufacturing program, is a little challenging, right? So you get a panini maker, right? You heat up your polystyrene. Um, sorry, I'm too fast there, right? So you get that, so you can get that so that those planes can be nice and flat, right? So the geometry can resemble in real life the way it does in the computer. Well, but sometimes you've got ones that don't fit in the panini maker, right? So you borrow your studio assistant's grandma's old electric stove, uh, you heat it to 195 degrees, you look on the internet to find out, you know, what's the melting point of styrene. You get a cookie sheet, some paper, some steel plates, pop it in the oven for 20 minutes, and voila, it's flat, right? I love this. This is my favorite part of the trial. I love to make things, right? I, I figured everything out in my life by making it, right? Not by planning it all out ahead of time. So then we get a bunch of pieces, right? And mind you, they're all labeled, right? They all have the holes. So it's a really elaborate assembly problem. Um, and we started assembling it, and we had some trouble. Uh, and it took a while to figure out, and it turned out that the some of those, some of those round, those rings were being unrolled backwards, right? So, which the, the, it was a glitch in the software, so we had to reverse them and re-roll re them, and then go back and correct them in the computer. But gradually, it started to come together. And here's the full-scale model. So then we're ready to. We have a proof of concept. So now here it is in steel, right? Um, 20,000 pounds of steel, um, 450 individual sheets, and there were 250 elements in this process. Now, as one of my students pointed out to me in the middle of this process, he says, you know, he says, the first digital sculpture you decided you were ever going to make could have been smaller. <laughs> but uh, that's, yeah. And if there is one image of, of all the images I possess that sort of discuss this kind of tension between the digital and the analog, it's this one, right? Trying to get this piece of steel to roll into a certain shape to get these holes to line up took all of my practical ingenuity that I had. And we started to assemble parts of the component. Uh, a big inventory problem. I don't know if any of you work in the digital design world, inventory is a huge issue. Turns out these architecture firms have gigantic IT departments now, with people who do nothing but work in, you know, Excel, right? Trying to keep track of all the parts and things, just like building anything. Uh, this is the courtyard where the sculpture uh, is installed. 
and here's the piece, first piece flying in. And you'll see we have the braces. So again, the challenge uh, in this process was really to keep um, keep the geometry as regular as possible, right? Because the steel wants to collapse. So we had to build a fairly elaborate scaffolding structure. Uh, when you work outside in November in upstate New York, it can snow. Here we are, uh, day six, uh, flying in some of the last parts. And that's what it looked like just after we finished it. And we had this sort of magical little powdery snow, November 9, 2014. And that's kind of what it looks like now from the side. So what's happened since then? Well, the, the software has gotten better, right? Or the definitions have been redefined and redone. Um, when you work with an engineering firm or any kind of collaborative thing, you don't always get the same people, right? You had a succession of sort of project managers and things that have helped me with these. This is an interior shot of that first uh, slide that I showed you. It's got a little pavilion, you can go in. It's about 22 feet high, 31 feet long, 22 feet wide. Uh, this is the last uh, latest piece that we've just finished. This is up uh, in the Hudson Valley, about 30 miles south of Albany on a private uh, collector's property. Um, and you can see now, you can really see in this image, you know, how, how much more we're shaping these objects than we used to, right? Um, so we sort of, so what we can do in the computer is we can have like virtual gravity, right? So it kind of, it actually, uh, a physics modeling engine which, uh, any of you interested in game design? Maybe, somebody, probably. So all of the physics modeling engines that they use in engineering simulations started as game engines because it was the first place that anyone needed something that looked real on a computer, right? So all the physics modeling engines were origin the original architecture comes from gaming, right? Because that was where the first market was. Here's the same piece early in the morning. Uh, you can see these are triangular shapes and I just want to finish off with a quick um, few slides here that uh, the project we're working on now um, to kind of give you an idea of what it looks like um, at present, right? So uh, I, I designed this surface, right? So this is the surface I make. Um, I, we can now have any number of entrances uh, in this, this, uh, this surface. So I'm gonna, I have two in this one. Uh, the next image, the image on the left shows you uh, what it, the circle packing part of this looks like. Uh, now they're, they're, coded, they're color coded as their size. Um, the whole way that they packed the circle is now different than it was originally um, designed. And then we do one more little math. Anybody ever heard of a Voronoi shape? Okay, so a Voronoi shape is very stable. So if you have a bunch of points, right, and then you connect them all, right, then you divide each of these lines in half, right, and you make a little perpendicular line. And then you extend that perpendicular line, right, until you get these kinds of intersections, right. And so what you end up then with is that within this Voronoi area, the Russian map, uh, I think it's Russian map, very Voronoi, I looked up last night, yeah. This is a Voronoi area, and basically that point is, 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 is in the structurally most optimum place for that in the center, right? That's, and it's super, super stiff, right? So then we generate, so from those circles, we generate this Voronoi grid, right? These blue lines. And then the, there's another part of the definition that makes a makes a circular shape that touches each of these bases, and then we can extrude these uh, shapes and forms. Um, one of the other things we're doing now that's quite different than before is this is actually three thicknesses of material. It's a quarter inch at the bottom, uh, eight, eight gauge in the middle, and 12 gauge at the top. So we're trying to, we can distribute the load where we need to. And on the left, you see a computer rendering, and you see it um, under construction. This this section is about to 
spot here. Right? And we're going to be in installing this piece in a couple of weeks uh, up in New Hampshire. So, um, uh, you know, working, I want to just say quickly, I don't want to some time question. So working in this digital field, this is, this is like really new for me, right? I, did, I started this in 2012, right? Um, and it's completely sort of revolutionized the way I, well, things I can do um, that I couldn't do before, right? So in the digital, you have, there's two, there's two poles of digital design, right? One which is about, it's called optimization. Right? And in optimization, you're trying to save time, money, material, right? So a machine can cut out very precise shapes, millions of them exactly the same, right? And it saves you tons of time, you know, down the road. The other is to uh, what the English call bespoke, right? Is that they're totally unique, right? And the way many craftspeople are using these digital technologies is that you literally can make something that you could not make in your own lifetime, let's say, right? That your the skill, the time, and so on. But, but you can make things that are one of a kind, right? And it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting sort of dichotomy that I sort of run across because we're I'm using both, right? So I'm using in some ways I'm using this to make these structures that I couldn't make, but I'm also because the because the designs are in data, that data can be used you know, by engineers to test, virtually test the structure before it's built, right? So there's, you know, it's an interesting place to be. Uh, there, there are a lot of artists who are using digital technology to make objects. The great majority of them are using them the same way they used to use the stone carving ateliers in, in Carrara. That is, they bring them a design and say, can you build this for me? Um, there's not so many artists that I'm aware of who are who are sort of trying to get in, into the sort of the tool generation, right? The kind of form finding um, aspects of this. Uh, you see a lot more of it in architecture and design. Um, and actually in the public art world, which is where a lot of my work exists, um, there are lots of architects and designers who have sort of dropped down into an art ecosystem and they're very hard to compete with, right? They make really beautiful things, but they're designers, right? So with me, you get me, but they're like, I'll do this, you do that. But anyway, I want to thank you again for uh, having me and um, happy to answer a few questions. Um, do you, or when you're problem solving prior to the digital mm -hmm. aspect, and you're problem solving in the digital aspect, there seems to be a lot of parallels. That is really the thing, what you said. So you start to kind of heat up the plastic, for example, yeah. or things like that. Are, are there, are there um, elements you miss about problem solving physically? I mean, you probably still do, but um, uh, or and and also, is there are there different outcomes right, that you feel? Well, I, I would say that the sort of the, as I've sort of moved close more into the sort of public sculpture mm -hmm. realm, they require more and more predictability. Right, uh, you can't play around and say. I like, you know, you have to tell them what's going to happen. Yeah. So, uh, and I've enjoyed, you know, I mean, this, this is, it's opened up this kind of way of working, as I said before, that I didn't have before. But I, I'm trying to find a way back to the, you know, when the snow falls and it collapses. Right? I mean, I, so I feel a little bit right now that I'm, you know, shading over to this kind of, you know, by necessity, the certain print. But I would like to make maybe sculptures like that that, you know, had a kind of, an unusual behavior, right? That didn't do exactly what they were supposed to do. Right? So I do, so I do miss that, right? I do, yeah. I do miss that. Yeah, I mean, you know, when I first started doing that, you know, I'd spend like days in front of the computer, and I'm like, wow, I'm not sure, this is not sure what I got this in. You know, uh, you know, I'm not drawing; I'm just sitting and looking at the screen. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so you went in the earlier work. Did you ever have any catastrophes? When the snow fell and it hit a person or something like that? Yeah. Uh, no, not gonna I've not had any real catastrophe. I had a scaffolding collapse on once while we were building. But that piece. wasn't your But what, that was during the construction process. Uh, and that was just poor judgment. Um, so no, no, I haven't had any 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 catastrophes that so far. I hope not to have any, but 
does the weather affect it over the course of the year? Well, um, it, so Odin, that the, that the, this original this project that stemmed all this work, is actually, um, by an engineering standpoint, there's a number of areas in which the structures fail. That is, some of those elements have collapsed or folded. Um, and uh, the piece has gotten short. Right? It's continued to sort of settle. Um, I'm hoping it doesn't do the full-on souffle, but um, but it is it, it has it has continued to evolve. These newer ones won't do that, right? They're they are engineered sometimes in a frustrating way not to change, but uh, they still move. So like Odin, when the wind blows, it shakes. Right? They're really you know how an airplane wing goes up and down like that when you fly. You guys like that or not? <laughs> Some people like. Well, like you're, you should be happy that it goes up and down. Because if it was rigid, the wings would have fallen off before you got to the end of the, end of the runway. It's a dynamic structure, right? It's designed to move and react to the stress, right? It's, and it's all riveted, right? It's all, it all can move, right? It can't move a lot, right? But that movement is an in integral to its strength, right? And that's the kind of strength or that systemic strength that I've gotten really interested in. Like bridges and yes, yeah, and buildings, right? This building moves a little. You can't feel it, but it's designed to move a little right? uh, under normal under normal conditions. Hundred year winds, that's what they call them. Engineers, right? Hundred year snows, those are their standards. Well, once in Syracuse, it snowed like eight feet, right? So every structure has to be tested for eight feet of snow, for example. Funny that the first slide showed the Colda and yours. Now Coldas don't move, not those that don't move. No, they're pretty. Miles. They're pretty stiff. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so it's, it's it was interesting. Also, that that plaza is uh okay, is designed by Skidmore Owings and Merrill. Um, it's kind of a classic modernist. It's got the county building and the city building, and actually the building behind my father's an architect, and the building behind it. And I grew up in Kalamazoo, not far from Grand. And the building behind it, he actually worked on. So it's interesting how you know how things come together. I thought I was going to be an architect too until I was got to college. It turned. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I see children want to find and go to mm -hmm. Do you ever get requests from steel playground? Uh, well, mostly I get that's like steel, and somebody's going to climb out of it and they're going to get hurt. Right. That's what I get. Right. Um, so I don't think I would get any playground requests. My sculptures can be climbed, and children are, they know what to do with my sculptures. Adults are always unsure, but they know. They just get right up in them and, you know, have a good time. And again, um, so far, we've never had any, um, any serious incidents, right? So, comes up a lot, though, that question. Usually, usually like, oh, they can climb. Yes? Um, you brought up the example of the wind earlier and how it blows the good shape. I've heard of sculptural pieces that it almost makes music when the wind blows through. Would you ever consider incorporating your work into something like that, where it almost makes like a music? Yeah, uh, I would be open to that idea. I think they'd have to be the openings would have to be a lot smaller to, to focus the vibration of the wind enough to make sound. Um, they do make a they sort of creep. You kind of you know they make a they don't make music in the musical sense, but they, they do generate some sound. Um, there was actually a, a, a piece I didn't show, actually it's a sculpture park in, uh, outside of Boston, uh, somebody wrote a, a piece of a symphony for it, they, like somehow inspired about it. Yeah, so, because this sort of, you know, there's, there's, you know, you can, this is patterns and you can see how that could translate to a sort of musical sort of, sort of idea. Yeah. I said one more uh, how does drawing uh, fit with? Because I I saw you show some of your drawings and mm -hmm. you didn't form your sculpture or vice versa. Uh, do you see that as like its own entity? Uh, yeah, I think so. When I when I when I made that sculpture that didn't have one form, I tried to think of ways of drawing that with a process that would sort of I would sort of find some forms. So I'd say that they're they're informed by the same ideas, but they don't. 
they don't really directly, you know, they're the same, they're the same kind of process. Like, how can I, what can I find through a process mm -hmm. that I would by, by taking a snapshot or something? So, um, but not, not, a, not in a formal way. Uh, sometimes, sometimes I'm, I'm involved in the siting. Uh, actually, it's, it's, you know, I, actually more than many other sort of public artists, I've been involved in a number of projects where I've actually part of the brief has actually been to help them decide where something should go. Um, and uh, but often it's you know there's a little red box on the drawing that they send you. But, um, yeah. Well, when I actually saw so like the last, like, so these pieces that I just showed, the last two pieces were actually designed specifically for those places. So these people invited me to come do, you know, look at, look at their, their property. Um, in one case, we had a landscape architect. We talked about what their ideas were. And so then we chose a spot, and then I designed it specifically for that spot. So it's scale. The way it's shaped, and everything. So, if they're not, since they're not quite as structurally site specific as they were before, they're always really, you know, they're sized according to that thing. So, Odin was sized to just fit in that courtyard, right? It was 40 feet, and the courtyard was like 50 feet or so. It was, it was deliberate, right? The size of it. And I saw uh, the color of the. Mm -hmm. Is that bronze? Steel? It's actually a weathering steel alloy. Sometimes they call it core 10, but it's a material that oxidizes on its surface and then uh, it oxidizes very, very slowly after that. So it's rust. It's an alloy that has a lot of nickel in it. Um, you see it sometimes with bridges. Um, sometimes uh, up where I live up in the Adirondack Parks, they use guardrails so they're not galvanized. But it's um, as long as the material doesn't collect water, it doesn't stay wet, the oxidation process is. Um, Pretty, very, very, almost, almost zero. They use a lot now, now for, in like in the desert southwest, they use it for roofs, and sometimes they're using that for building planning. Yeah, that's what I want to ask because um, sometimes I look at part of it is like they look at rusted. Yeah. Like, I thought it was yeah. like, you would just leave it? To no, that's so, like it, take, it takes several years before the, the whole thing kind of gets uniform, right? It's, you're, you're not meant to do anything to it, you just need to wait. Um, but that sort of, but it's a very rich, sort of reddish brown. It's not, better than normal rust. <laughs> but it varies a little bit depending on the climate. So. Do you, what, these public commissions, how are they funded? Uh, Any grants? Some, sometimes uh, a, a whole host of ways. Um, we often, need one. We should apply for a grant. Yeah, so um, <laughs> some, some institutions or cities have uh, just all the percentage of their construction budgets to purchasing artwork, um, sometimes they'll raise money, <laughs> private fundraising, I've done, sometimes done co-fundraising, I've had to raise some funds, so uh, a lot of different ones. There's one, one more question. Um, so it's, I know you talked a little bit about material and steel being important to the work, mm -hmm. um, but as your work moves into the, this like digital design realm and architectural realm, 3D printing becomes more available in architectural structures. Do you see that possibly working its way into for an yeah, alternative material? I think, I think probably not 3D printed, but lots of different kinds of sheet yeah. materials, carbon fiber, um, you know, there's all kinds of really interesting. So they're now, so like with carbon fiber, you can, within the sheet itself, you can change its behavior, yeah. right? So they're, so they make these, they make airplane wings out for some stealth fighter that actually, as the stress goes, they, they just twist. The whole the whole thing twists so it'll behave differently. So yeah, that would be, so there probably. And then you could, but with the same thing, that they're using kinds of printing processes to lay down those, <coughs> those, those fibers in certain directions and certain, you know, consistencies, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. College of the Steam Lecture Series. Thank you so much. The generosity that I have down from Okay, and this is Cindy from Pearson.
help support this theme lecture series. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.